Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is under global scrutiny tonight over civilian casualties caught up in the war against the Hamas terrorist group. But Israel has warned the war is far from over and could go on for months. Addressing the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, Benjamin Netanyahu said, we are not stopping and we will not stop until we are victorious because we, are, we have no country but this one and we have no other way. Well, let's bring in our panel, former Speaker of the House of Representatives, the great Bronwyn Bishop, and former Victorian Liberal Party President Michael Kroger. Joining me, it's great to have you both on the program. I mean, Bronwyn, I think Benjamin Netanyahu's right. He's got to stand for what he believes in. Yes, he does, Gary. And seriously, it made me think of what was happening in the 1930s in Germany and in Poland. And, of course, Poland was the home of European Jewry. There were three million Jews lived in Poland wow. uh, in the 30s, out of a total population of 9.5 million. Now, they'd had a pact with Hitler in 1934 that he wouldn't invade them. He pulled out in 39. Hitler then sent in a force, 1.5 million people, soldiers. In the, on, the 7, on the 1st of September, 1939, on the 17th of September, Russia invaded from the other side in accordance with Stalin and Hitler's agreement. On the 6th of, November, of October, the last Polish fighter surrendered. Three million wow. Jews died, the three million of them, except for 200,000, 136,000 of which were in Russia. Now, when Netanyahu makes that statement, he knows what oblivion, what genocide, what murder of the Jews means. And if you look at the world population now, there are 16 and a half million Jews in the entire world. There are 2.3 billion Muslims in the world. And so the, when they say, this is all we've got, and when they say the river to the sea, they mean push the Jews out and write them off. They want mm. them gone. You can see what that statement means and you can see what they're fighting for. So we have to remember yeah, what Michael, history I mean, says. This war... Yeah, I agree. And, Michael, I mean, the war could stop tomorrow if Hamas surrendered. I, I heard you say that the other day, and I've been saying it to a lot of other people as well. I mean, there's just so much pressure on Netanyahu uh, going on here. But, in fact, Hamas really are the ones that have to put down the weapons, stop fighting and let peace have a chance. Yeah, Gary, of course they do. And uh, Biden should have said this on day one. He should have said on day one, exactly. uh, the way to get peace, the way to stop the war is for this terrorist, these Palestinian terrorists uh, to lay down their weapons and, uh, you know, face arrest. Uh, but no, they use human shields. They couldn't care two hoots about the common Palestinians. Uh, so, so, you know, they've, they've obviously been... Uh, in, in, in significant numbers been killed because of the cowardice of the Hamas Palestinians. But, mate, yeah, of course this could have been over, but why the West didn't say to keep the pressure on the Hamas and the Palestinian leadership, uh, the pressure seems in the press on Israel, for goodness sake. Well, it was the Palestinian terrorists that crossed the border uh, from Gaza into southern Israel in October, not the other way around. So Netanyahu's 100% right. Uh, there is no option for the West and the world. Uh, Israel have to finish the job. Um, I note, by the way, we didn't leave a cohort of Nazis, you know, in Munich or somewhere. Uh, we didn't three quarters finish the war uh, in, in, you know, in, the, in yeah. 1945 and, and, and leave, you know, in Bavaria, for example, a couple hundred thousand Nazis to sort of, uh, you know, keep going. No, Israel have got no option. And the West have to support them. And the weakness of people in the West will long be remembered by those who were appalled by their failure to understand the need for moral clarity on this issue, mate. Yeah, we're seriously lacking leadership everywhere. Meanwhile, the heads uh, of Australia's major public service departments, Prime Minister and Cabinet on down, have received uh, a really quite a nice result, the latest round of pay rises, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars more than the Prime Minister. I guess there's nothing new in all of that, but Prime Minister Albanese currently earns about uh, 587000 Well, he's paid it anyway. And by contrast, uh, the Secretary of his department, Glenn Davis, who I must admit I know, 
He was my tutor years ago at Griffith Uni. I think I was the only Conservative that got out of that great left-wing university. But anyway, uh, he's on 977,000. Yep, 977. The secretaries of the Departments of Attorney General, Defence, Social Services, they've all been boosted up to this sort of million dollars a year base pay. I mean, Michael... Fat cat salaries uh, necessary to keep government departments competitive with the private sector? Really? Is that no, the story? No, no, I don't no, think so. No, 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 this is nonsense, Gary. I mean, I don't think any of these public servants' heads, by the way, should be paid more than the Prime Minister. I mean, for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. His job is harder, it's more short-term, it's riskier, it's got a, a tenure every three years, a risk. Um, I'm sure if you paid some of these people 100000 less, they'd still, you know say, OK, I'll take that, or even two <laughs> or 300000 or less. I would think, Gary, four to $500,000, uh, um, if they can earn more in the private sector, great. Go and earn more, more with that fee at Macquarie Bank or somewhere else. But why we need to pay almost a yeah. million dollars to people like Glyn Davis, you do not. And this is, again, part of these elites in Canberra paying huge salaries, you know, uh, totally unnecessary and totally removed from the ordinary Australians, who are, many of whom are earning less than one-tenth of that, mate. Oh, Michael, you remember well, it's Keating's Glenn legacy. <laughs> Yeah. It is. Yeah, it is. Well, but see, Glenn, Glenn Davis was once a teacher of mine, right, and he taught me public policy. And when he left Brisbane to go to Melbourne... Uh, it was Wayne Goss, Kevin Rudd and I, we were the three people that said farewell to him. And his wife, Margaret Gardner, of course, now is Her Excellency, the Governor of Victoria. So they're not doing too badly as a household just uh, for form. Uh, meanwhile, let's talk about the Red Sea, uh, Bromman, and attacks on shipping in the Red Sea. Well, it could hit global supply lines, exactly what we do not need. The delay of deliveries of staples and things like chemicals to steel cars. Food products, major shipping companies ceased operations uh, in the region because of piracy attacks by Yemen's Houthi rebels. Yes. Um, and, of course, meanwhile, uh, Bromman, we, we can't even rustle up a vessel to assist. We just learned last week that Australia is unlikely to send a warship uh, to protect merchant vessels in the Red Sea. I thought we were an island nation. I thought we should have a navy that's got that capacity. Well, Gary, it's not a question of we can't send it. It's a question that we won't. And this socialist prime minister and this socialist government are showing their true colours. Uh, immediately after the, uh, the deal was done that we would get um, the uh, submarines from the United States, the Virginia class, um, we, we had to vote in the United Nations uh, about a ceasefire, which again was to say, let Hamas rearm. And we voted against our allies, against the United States and against Great Britain. And then we get a request from the United Great States, could we please send a, a ship? Oh, no, we couldn't possibly do that. We're too busy in the Pacific. Busy doing what? We can't even stand up to the Chinese <laughs> properly. We can't even stand up for our own sailors when they're attacked by the Chinese. And they're saying we can't send a frigate. We have had frigates in the Middle East for decades. I have been on a frigate in the Persian Gulf. I have seen... Me too. We have had, <laughs> indeed, we have had frigates, the, the Anzac-class frigates, which, as a gift of the Hawke government, were fitted for but not with. In other words, they didn't have proper armaments on it. We have had years. We could easily put on the required armaments to be a support ship um, as requested uh, into the Red Sea and this is part of the trade that we depend on. This is a government that doesn't, yeah. socialist governments don't look after nations, they look after power for themselves and serving their, their sectional interests and this is why we are now seeing them in their true colours and the sooner we get rid of them the better this country will be served. We've got a weak Prime Minister who evacerates they, they, they've worked out that there are only 99,000 Jews in this country and 981,000 Muslims in this country and they're in Labour Party seats and they're weak at the knees shaking that they're going to lose the votes to the Greens. It is a disgraceful government that has to go. See, so, so Michael Kroger, you've been around a long time. We all have, all three of us, right? We've been around this political world a long time in different forms. And I'm watching this lack of leadership What are you thing, trying to say, Gary? Quite right. I mean, what, what are you trying to say there, Gary? Well, I'm just trying to say... We've got experience, mate. We have experience, right? We've seen okay. this sort of numptiness before and we'll call it out any time. But I'm thinking about this raving insanity of Chris Bowen. You know, he, he wants to kill off coal as a power source, uh, you know, along with Australian farmers and other industries, and I think we're all in the firing line too because we're carbon units, if you know that line out of the Star, Star Trek movie. Uh, but it, it now means that we are suffering, can you believe this or not, a skill shortage 
amongst those who are actually capable of maintaining coal-fired power stations. You see, they've all left the sector. And the government in Queensland, for instance, is subsidising people to leave coal-fired power stations to rot. Uh, explosions at one of the biggest, Calide in central Queensland, have already reduced power supply in recent years. So, you know, this is just going to get mm. worse and worse and worse. Our mm. power supply is going to be mm. in peril. Look, mate, I, I don't think in a, in a change portfolio you ever want to put in charge a zealot. And that's exactly what Chris Bone is. <laughs> exactly. He's a zealot with a blank cheque. Yeah. Isn't he? All right. He's a zealot with a yeah. blank cheque. And Jimmy Chalmers is there unable to unable to stop him. Uh, Albo urging him on from from the sidelines. Uh, and uh, is it going well? No, it's not going well. If it was going well, mate, um, we'd have the two hundred and seventy five dollar reduction in our power bills. So if you just concentrate on that issue, if if, if Albanese and, and, and uh, Bowen were in charge of this, if it, if it was going to plan, we'd be able to see that decrease in power bills. And let's not forget, one of the core reasons Albanese won that election, yes, the Liberal government had basically been exhausted after nine years and three prime ministers, etc., and they won in 19 against the tide. But his key yep. message of reducing power bills and that really it was quite easy to keep this cost of living thing under control. There's a massive crisis out there, he kept saying a hundred times, but the $275 reduction is just easy. You know what I'd love to see? I'd love to see the modelling. You know, Jim Chalmers ought to release, yeah. and Bowen ought to release the modelling that underpinned their statement. I mean, having been involved in the floats of some public companies, um, you, you, are, you are, as a director of, of a public company, every single word in the prospectus has to be verified as being true under threat of a criminal prosecution if, if, if there's a false and misleading statement. Yet here's a bloke that's won an election you know, in, in large parts because of his promise to ease the cost of living burden. He made this promise about the 275, what was it, 98, 96 times he, he, he repeated it. Release the modelling, yeah, whatever uh, it was. Chris Bowen. Where's your modelling? Let's have it independently yeah. verified as to how you got to that number because you seem to have been wildly wrong. And was that, was that um, inducement to voters fair and reasonably made, mate? Yeah, no, I, look, I think pulling all your energy eggs in one basket's a mistake. Chris Bowen is a mistake. Bromman Bishop is right as a leadership failure. The Prime Minister's got to bring these people around or else uh, get out of the way and let someone in Correct. who will. Michael Kroger, Bromman Bishop, great to see you both. Happy New Year.